Do you suffer from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or IBS and can't find the driving cause? Have you been through numerous cycles of antibiotics or antimicrobials, seeing short-term improvement, but keep relapsing after treatment? Most practitioners are taught to take a bottom-up approach focused on killing bacteria to improve gut health and the rest of the body as a whole. However, in many people, this approach is not effective in the long term. In some, a top-down approach is necessary, looking at the faulty mechanisms which are controlling the gut to begin with. In this video, we will examine how a mild deficiency in vitamin B1, also known as thiamine, can produce symptoms which are practically identical to SIBO, IBS, GERD, and other gut disorders. Insufficiency in this nutrient is far more common than many believe it to be, and some of the main causes include long-term consumption of refined foods low in thiamine, frequent alcohol, coffee, or tea consumption, certain medications, chronic infection and increased overall metabolic demand, and also long-term chronic digestive issues which have a negative effect on absorption. Gut specific symptoms which one might experience when bacteria become overgrown in the small intestine include flatulence and bloating after meals, abdominal discomfort, intolerance of FODMAP plant foods, and chronic diarrhea, constipation, or a mixture of both. Some well-established causes include low stomach acid or acid lowering drugs, poor bile flow, food poisoning can be a trigger, someone with immunodeficiency or autoimmunity against the gut, autonomic nervous system dysfunction, other factors like chronic antibiotic use, problems with the ileocecal valve and other malabsorptive disorders. To protect against SIBO, the digestive system must be in good working order at all times. If anything fails to work as it should, then one could be susceptible to bacterial overgrowth. First of all, high acidity in the stomach is a great defense. It's capable of killing microbes. If one has low stomach acid, bacteria can survive and enter into the small intestine and then go on to proliferate. Another key defense is the pancreas. Not only is it responsible for generating enzymes which help to break down food to then be absorbed, but it also releases several antibiotic substances which help to eradicate microbes in the intestine and function to balance the gut microbiome. A functioning pancreas is also necessary for intestinal motility. Furthermore, the liver is responsible for producing bile, which is then stored in the gallbladder and later released into the intestine where it's necessary for the digestion of fat and is also very potent antimicrobial properties. Probably one of the most important ways in which the gut protects against an overgrowth is through peristalsis. This is basically the rhythmic contractions which propel food and everything else onto the next stage of the GI tract. In many cases, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is fundamentally a motility disorder. It is essential to understand that each of those functions I've discussed are directed and coordinated by the nervous system in the upper gut. And this is connected to the brain via the vagus nerve. This nerve is responsible for stimulating bile flow, signaling the stomach to produce gas gastric acid and empty at the right times. Direct the pancreas to produce and release digestive enzymes. Instruct the intestine to contract as it should and also to dampen inflammation in the gut and maintain the gut barrier function, which basically means to prevent it from becoming leaky. The vagus nerve does this through using a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Poor vagus nerve communication is sometimes referred to as poor vagal tone. This condition has been shown to reduce motility and activity of the GI tract as a whole. It's also been de demonstrated in SIBO and other gut conditions and nerve stimulation has been effectively used to improve SIBO in some research. The vagus nerve connects the gut directly to the brain at regions which control the entire autonomic nervous system. Not only does this nerve convey information coming from the gut, but is also directly responsible for telling the peripheral organs what to do at what times. 
These brain areas have a consistently high requirement for energy and therefore micronutrients which are required to generate energy. An energy deficit in these regions can result in incorrect signals being sent to the rest of the body and problems with the autonomic nervous system as a whole. This includes the organs of the gut. And so onto the topic of this video, it's interesting to note that exactly the same regions of the brain which control the autonomic nervous system are also the first to be affected by a deficiency of thiamine. Looking at how low amounts of this vitamin can affect the body as a whole, much of the symptoms caused by thiamine deficiency originate from within the nervous system. Wernicke encephalopathy primarily affects the brain. Dry beriberi affects the peripheral nerves. Wet beriberi is predominantly the heart and circulation, and gastrointestinal beriberi affects the nervous system in the GI tract. This lesser known condition has many similarities with other gut disorders, producing symptoms such as nausea, gastroparesis, gut pain and bloating, constipation and or diarrhea, and severe nutrient malabsorption. Thiamine deficiency can destroy gut health through numerous mechanisms. Firstly, recall that the vagus nerve requires acetylcholine to communicate its messages to the organs of the gut. Acetylcholine is also needed for the contraction of the intestine. Thiamine is essential for the production of acetylcholine and the action of acetylcholine. And so acetylcholine can become drastically low in thiamine deficiency. In the stomach, thiamine deficiency can cause a loss of sphincter control. Stomach acid production slows right down, and emptying of the stomach is also often compromised. This will typically present as upper bloating, reflux, gastroparesis, as sometimes there is undigested food in the stool. At the level of the pancreas, digestive enzyme production is significantly reduced. One study showed that enzymes located on the brush border of the intestine were reduced up to 66%. Furthermore, gallbladder emptying of bile can also be negatively impacted. The result is that one loses the ability to break down and obtain nutrition from food that they eat. These people are often reliant on hydrochloric acid supplements, digestive enzymes, and sometimes bile salts as well. So the question is, is it SIBO? GERD or IBS, or is it actually thiamine deficiency in some people? To summarize, this deficiency can cause all of the hallmark chronic gut complaints, including poor bile flow, low stomach acid, low digestive enzymes, malabsorption, slow intestinal motility, chronic constipation and diarrhea, and because of the effects on the vagus nerve, coupled with everything else, even intestinal permeability and GI inflammation in the long run. So if you follow my channel, you will have a fairly good idea of how overlooked this deficiency actually is. And although this is not applicable to everyone or even most, I'm certain that there's a subpopulation of people who this does apply to, as I've seen it play out so many times before. When looking to address this, the question is, which is the best form to use? This is highly individual, and any form is probably sufficient to address a genuine deficiency in most people. However, there is one form which has superior qualities and has been studied specifically for its role in addressing gut motility. This form is also capable of penetrating the blood-brain barrier and saturating the nervous system. The name of this form is thiamine tetrahydrofurfural disulfide, abbreviated TTFD and is the form of choice in Japan, where it was originally studied. In research, it was shown to act directly on smooth muscle cells of the intestine to produce a remarkable increase in the amplitude of rhythmic contractions. Another study showed that TTFD also acted on the enteric neurons to increase motility. Another case report showed reversal of severe gastroparesis and constipation within just a few weeks. The dosage that is generally effective for most is to begin with 50 or 100 milligrams per day, gradually increasing up to between 200 and 500 milligrams per day, depending on each individual. One should also be aware to take the other nutritional cofactors, which I discuss in numerous other videos on my channel. To conclude, 
If antimicrobials and antibiotics have not managed to fix your gut issues and you think that this might apply, then it's worth trying it out. Generally, thiamine is very safe and can be effective in some people. I hope you found this video helpful and see you in the next one.